Hello my friends and welcome back to Divide and Conquer version 5 which is finally out on the Divide and Conquer Discord for an open beta as of I think the 13th of December so 3 to 4 days ago depending on when I get this video uploaded. I apologize for the delay here, it was my winter break, I am on break until January 4th and I decided I would spend some time not worrying about YouTube, just taking a break and not doing anything like that so but I'm finally here to deliver on my promise to do an overview video which primarily I'll be going through the brilliant overview text file that Lord of Links has provided for the mod and as you can see starting off we have a brand new um, splash screen so as you go into custom battle or campaign you'll get different screens it's all nice it's all beautiful so primary major features of the mod are going to be the fact that the barracks event has been removed and if you've been following the beta for a while you would know that um, if you don't now you don't need to wait 64 turns to um, create your elite units you simply just need to create the infrastructure which for all factions is typically tied to either a combination of their blacksmith or their town hall and the barracks line so some require you to have like a blacksmith and at a certain level town hall, others just require the town hall. So it's kind of a mix and match there depending on the faction. But if you want to rush, say, uh, let's say look at uh, Gondor here. If you want Wardens of the White Tower, you can rush those um, in Minas Tirith, um, which is honestly where I would do it for Gondor, and get them... I don't know how early you could do it, I haven't seen it, but for a lot of factions, if you rush it, you can get to it in about... 20 to 30 turns depending on who you are the orc factions kind of have an advantage with that given their high amount of castles and low requirements but they also have lower high tier units like mordor can get black rooks i think within like 12 to 15 turns you can start pumping those out which is incredibly fast um many nations also have a unique barracks that provides access to their elite units um mostly dol guldur and dol Amroth. so in dol Amroth, you'll have special a swan knight stables that you have to create in order to get all of your elite knights so that's something fun there i will now go into the um into the battle map here i'm just gonna pick gondor so while that's loading the uh, mission button when you click that will now give you a faction overview and that is for every faction in the game it'll tell you about who they are their lore their key features and their scripts so you kind of get a you know, a reoccurring button that you can press in case you're ever lost on anything that'll kind of guide you on what you should do. Also, there's been UI elements that have been overhauled. So, um, the Wildman factions now use the Northmen UIs, and that has allowed the Northern Dunedain to have their own UI, which I've shown in my Northern Dunedain videos here. Um, also, every faction now has pretty much unrestricted um, construction towards large cities and strongholds though some have script requirements so someone like Khan for example might I think they have to go with the blue wizards I believe or it could be that they side with Mordor I can't actually quite recall their restriction but pretty much everyone can here's to show the uh, faction info button so you click your missions and then it'll show you all the faction info so a little description on Gondor their culture special features so settlement restoration Madness of Denethor, Fiefdom Recruitment, no building limitations, and level 1 to 5 armor, and then the one ring script, and then it'll actually open up the missions panel, so you still get to see any missions that you've been assigned, so that is there, and I don't, is this a new UI for Gondor? No, I think this is a classic UI, I could be wrong, but, you know, I, you gotta admire it, it does look pretty, pretty nice. And while we're talking about the UIs, I might as well bring up the Northern Dunedain as that does tie into the next part of the overview. So here's the brand new Northern Dunedain UI, their faction info button, and also the treasuries, the little splash screen in those have been updated also, so that they no longer feature a map of Europe. But anyway, the Dunedain are probably, arguably, the main feature of version 5, either them, or you could also say the triple wild men overhaul which i am also a huge fan of so starting with the northern dunedain you can either choose to pursue the reformation of the reunited kingdom in which case you will take over all of gondor and dolomroth and you will be one combined faction with virtually their entire roster is available to you i don't know if there's anything that you can't recruit there might be like the odd militia unit that you might not be able to grab 
Like, it, it, there might be Gondor Militia. I could be wrong about that. Um, but other than, like, the odd occasional unit here or there, you will have pretty much everything Gondor has to offer, everything Dol Amroth has to offer, and everything in Eriador. Except for the Breland units, unless you actually conquer the Breland settlements with your military, which, I mean, you know, the world is your oyster. Alternatively, you may um, reform the Kingdom of Arnor, in which case you will assimilate with Bree. You'll have the Shire, you'll have this whole breadbasket of economy here, and you will be the sole protector and human force here in Eriador, at least on the forces of good. So arguably, Enid Wythe is neutral, as is Dunland. You will have, basically, a easier campaign, I would think, if you go with Arnor as you stay centralized in this one region. You don't have to deal with a split kingdom and corruption happening by having Gondor and Dolomroth, and you won't have to fight, you know, the Ardenaim, Harad, Khand, and Mordor all by yourself if you do that. You'll also have access to the House of Kings in Enuminos, which is the strongest building in the game. Um, I may have overtuned it when I did it, but I felt it was reasonable given the importance. It will give you a global law bonus of, I think, 10 to 20%. Um, which will help you with corruption either route that you go. So if you go with the Reunited Kingdom, I highly recommend still getting a Numenos and building that, as that will help mitigate a lot of corruption in Gondor. And also it gives you a global free upkeep slot too. So regardless of what you do, a Numenos is one of the most important cities in the game. In fact, I would say it is the most important city for the Northern Dunedain. So definitely go for that regardless of your choice. Now, when you go with the Reunited Kingdom, you will no longer have the Beacon of Hope recruitment mechanic, which if I... I don't know if there's mercenaries on turn one, so this might not work. Here we go. So you can get, like, Breland Militia, Journeyman, Archer Militia, with Erefor here. But if you do that um, with the Reunited Kingdom, I believe you probably lose access to these units. But if I were to take him into Dunland or Enidwife, um, Dale, Darwinian, Gondor, Dolomrav, Rohan, you'd have access to... Buy a nice selection of units that you can recruit, but you lose those mercenaries if you join with the United Kingdom, and instead you must own those lands and then create a building in them. You can also create buildings with um, the Arnor route, so if you build your encampment, you will get local militia, but with the United Kingdom, you can build a special auxil auxiliary barracks, which gives you a lot of that nation's powerful units, but it does mean that you can't just simply walk in and Grab a bunch of units. These Breland ones, they might be available regardless, so that might not be the best example, but you'll see as you play out, you have different options, and there's basically a lot of replayability with the Northern Dune and Dine now, depending on um, how you want to play. And they also have brand new visuals, so I'll go over that in a little bit here. In fact, actually, this would probably be a great time to transition to that, so I will see you guys out on the battlefield. And we are back here to go over the Wild Men, but before that, I did look into it. It was Krebel, who, if I hope I, I said his name right. Krebel is the one who has done new models for the roster, so special thanks to him for that. So now we're going to go into the Wild Men, and for this, I'm just going to do it from the faction selection screen. So, the Vale of Anduin, the Clans of Anadwyth, and the Dunlendings have had completely new campaigns and completely new rosters for version 5, so they are no longer the same as they were before. Starting with, arguably, I'm, I'm split between my favorites being Dunland and the Anduin. I really like the Anduin right now. So, we'll start with the Anduin. Uh, they have a split barracks recruitment system, so you can either create a barracks for the Aeltheod or the Bjornings or the Woodsmen. Each of those lines has their own um, special units that you recruit, and so you are locked to one also. So, if you build a Aeltheod camp, you will not be able to create a Bjorning camp. And there's no, like, region restrictions for these. These are for anywhere in the world. So if you conquer the whole map, you can assign these settlements to train whatever you want. So for the Aeltheod, you'll have, like, horse archers and cavalry um, and horse skirmishers, which are actually really powerful. For the Bjornings, you'll have really strong stalwart warriors, you know, the classic Bjorning axemen, um, Bjorning shield bearers, and then higher tier variants of those. And the including the incredibly powerful bear warriors now, the... One of the best shock infantry units in the game, if I had to say so myself. And for the woodsmen, you get your archers and javelins and skirmishers. So pick what you want with those. Um, some of their notable units, Fram's Guard, are a very powerful cavalry unit with uh, axes. 
Bear Warriors and Greenwood Foresters, kind of the top tier units that you can get from each of those barracks, um, respectively. In order to unlock their high tier cities, you must build mountain pass fortifications. These are like, think of the tolls, mountain fortifications. They'll give you money, so you'll earn money and income from building these, and they'll also allow you to eventually unlock your highest tier cities. So as you progress and build up the infrastructure, you unlock higher tier buildings, stone walls, and that sort of good stuff. So they were a very fun campaign, and also the honey resource has had an expansion, uh, which is now if you expand kind of into, so there's honey across Ravanian and Rohan and a few other places like towards Mladris and in Ariador. So their unique honey building, the apiary, now is more available. Before it was very limited. I want to say it was somewhere around maybe a dozen regions actually had honey. So it was kind of unfair if you compared it to Anandwyth and Dunlin who had the tanneries and the fisheries. So Anandwyth, I mean anywhere, anywhere coastal or had a river that had the fish resource, you could put the fishery and make a lot of money. And that is on most of the map if you think about it. For Dunlin, the hides were a little more limited, but most regions had furs and hides that you could create a tannery from. But honey was very, very limited, so it's been added to more regions, to, which also helps other factions. Like Rohan has, I think in the lore it was mentioned they had honey mead, so I mean, or they had mead, so it made sense that they'd have honey there. So there's been honey in Rohan, honey in Dorwinian, honey in Ravanian. So as you play Anduin, you'll have more options to get your high tier honey building around, which also helps with their culture so a very fun faction i like the anduin i like their new visuals we'll go on to dunlin next if you've been watching my dunlin campaign you kind of know what's going on here you must choose to either go with isengard or go against them and you're not like forced into that decision it's at your own pace if you want to go against them all you have to do is send a diplomat to them and you will stand alone but that will make a very difficult campaign when you play as Dunland, Isengard is set to passive. You are pretty much the only evil force here. Debatable. I mean, you can be neutral and do what you want. But they have completely new lore, completely new scripts with Isengard and Rohan, and a completely new roster. Some of their notable units, Heralds of the Twofold King, which you get if you take Edoras. They are a very powerful throwing axe cavalry. Dunheard Slayers are their classic slayers, but I believe they've been given more armor. And Frecklinger Stalwarts, a powerful lance and shield cavalry unit. Um, completely new roster, very strong infantry, very heavy infantry too. If you stay with Isengard or conquer Isengard, you get the Eisenmach units, I believe. Isengard, or no, Orthanc Wardens and the Orthanc Guard. So Eisenmach, those are now the um, Dune, are they the Dune here? No, Wolfguard units. So you have Wolfguard Axemen and Wolfguard Pikes. Um, which are about the same tier as the Eisenmach Axemen were before. So, completely new fa new roster for Dunland. I love their campaign. They also have Slingers, which is completely new for their faction and completely new for the mod. So, high fire rate. They get through their ammo quickly. They do a lot of damage. So, if you play Dunland, definitely recruit their Slingers. Also, for Anadwyth, uh, where are they? Right here. I always miss their banner. Clans of Anandwyth have also gone through an overhaul. You now only start with Alk food. You no longer have like Dol Vorn and a few other scattered settlements. You just have Alk food. And as you expand to take other factions, like if you take Haras, you will unlock Gon Borigon for your faction. You'll unlock the Juradine. If you take um, a few other settlements around, like if you take Londaire, you'll unlock the Liadan clan. So as you conquer the other clan seats, you'll unlock their units. They typically have a low tier and a high tier unit so the Moradag fishermen you get in Barad Vin uh, when they upgrade to the Moradag skirmishers there's a significant leap in power there and once you've united all the clans uh, you are prompted to conquer Tharbad in which case you will then be able to rename it to Athamor uh, through construction of a building there the tier for soil is over there and I butchered that name I remember someone mentioned how you pronounce the like, kind of Celtic names, and I wish I <laughs> I should have looked at that before this. But you create that, and you basically become a new faction. You become the Kingdom of Athamor. So you basically progress from being a wild man, being these scattered tribes, into your own proper kingdom, which I think is fun for, you know, building up the lore and building yourself as a proper faction. 
and that will unlock your special units, your end of life guardsmen, cavalry, and archers. So you get some very strong late game units if you do that. So end of life completely redone. Uh, and uh, Dunland also and the Anduin. So have fun with the Wildmen nations. They are much funner than they used to be. So I'm going to let this battle go out while I read through the rest of the changes. So the R. Ardenium have had a completely new um, roster, as in their visuals have changed. So they now look much, much better. Credits to Castellan for doing that. The Lovlorian and Woodlands Realms Alliance script has also been extend, uh, expanded. So if you accept the alliance, you'll now merge those factions and you'll get four of their units. But if you reject it, you'll be able to train your elite unit anywhere. So that would be the Arid Heareth for the Woodland Realm, and I forget which one it is for Lothlorien. It's, it's one of their special Archer Spearman units. You can get those pretty much anywhere. I think it's, is it the Barrio e Ingole? I think that's the one. You can train those pretty much anywhere as long as you have the Barracks, and you'll be able to create the very, very powerful Yavanna's Garden, which allows you to recruit Ents in a few cities, being Harris Galadhan, Randwheel's Halls and Dolgoldur, so you can get Ents in more regions if you reject the Alliance. If you play as Khan, you may also pick to start as a Horde, so that means that you could either start with the traditional start, you'll have the option to choose either to side with Mordor or to side with the Blue Wizards, or you can say, you know what, nope, we're going to pack it up and we're going to go where we want. That does lock you in to the Mordor route of the script, so you won't be able to get the Dwarves if you do that. And you will also be able to create the Inquisitor buildings in major, like, settlements of the forces of good. So, like, Dale, uh, Minas Tirith, um, in anywhere that's, like, very important in the setting, you can create the Inquisitor's building there if you play as Khan. So looking at units and unit visuals, there are also new visuals for Elrond, the Emmanuel Swordmasters, the Riders, and the Rangers. Credit to uh, Arthel Arthelion there. The uh, Dorgoldur has a brand new unit for their um, bodyguards. They are now an axe-throwing Uruk unit, so pretty unique. I don't think there's any other orcs that throw axes. They also have spiders now, so they have great spiders of Mirkwood, and the goblins have riderless wargs, and those do not crush the game as they used to. The high paladins and armsmen of Dorwinian now have new looks and they have some elves mixed into their units to reinforce the fact that this is a nation of men and elves the bodyguard for Eridluin, the tamun zahar nobles are now a spear and crossbow unit so i believe that's the only crossbow general in the game if i remember correctly they should be they should be the only crossbow general that there is which makes them very unique outside of like saruman's bodyguard so, very powerful unit, still good against cavalry, good at shooting, kind of fits their whole pike and shot kind of faction that they are. Uh, the Corsair Raiders and Corsair Archers are now properly named as such, um, instead of being Ezra Zaire, and they have their voice lines from Battle for Middle-Earth, and if you are a non-Elven faction, you can recruit to Corsairs from pretty much any coastline along the ocean, uh, so as long as you're on an Elves, I mean, men... Uh, forces of good, forces of evil, they are now neutral pirates that you can recruit. The Variags of, no the Variag Nobles of Khand have had brand new visuals courtesy of the Cowering Coma. And also the Balrune units have also been given new visuals for Khand. Hardalon Sentinels and Riders also getting new visuals. As well as the Orthanc Guard, Orthanc Wardens, um, those are now very, very powerful Isengard units that also Dunlin can get. Herat's Generals, their Serpent Bladesmen, their Serpent Cavalry, Black Snake Guard, Serpent Archers, and the Southrun Defenders have been given new models as well. And we talked about it earlier that the Slingers have been given for Dunlin. And we might see Slingers for other factions in the future. There's a few potential candidates out there. As for battle maps, Karis Galadhan now has a new battle map, as well as Umbar, Dolomroth, and the Orc battle maps now have new visuals as well. Now for campaign strategy map models, there are new CSMs for these settlements for the Wildmen factions, Bree, Angmar, the Northern Dunedain, the Orcs, Khand, and Harad for their large cities and strongholds. There's also new unique strategy map models for the Anduin Hobbit Villages, the Bree Hobbit Villages, 
Fjortals, Rosegabel, Bree itself, City of Dale, Anon Edorod, Minas Morgul, the Black Gate, uh, Ruined Anuminas, and Isengard. And there's also new Fort CSMs for the um, encampments, the Elven, Wildmen, and Dwarven versions. Here's Ungol and Hena the Noon also have unique forts for their models that are linked to the uh, settlements next to them, so Minas Morgul and Kyr Andros. So they are no longer settlements themselves, but they still retain their unique battle maps. And on the campaign, they still look like proper forts as they should, as long as you have the other their linking settlements within view. There's also new models for Harad's leaders, generals, spies, Gondor's generals and captains, Gul Amroth's generals, Breeze generals, the Ar Ardenayim generals, Pond, Unabad's faction leaders, generals, captains, and spies, Gul Goldur's generals, captains, and spy models, Ulyron's strategy model, Erebor's captain, Rune's captain, Dorwinian's general and captain models, Dunlin's faction leader, general, captain, spy, and diplomat models. So many, many new strategy map models for pretty much all the factions. You're going to see something new that wasn't in 4.6. And going into the remaining minor features and scripts, the Ardenayim have a new portrait set. The Dorwinian choice script has been rewritten and expanded, so when you take Morded Hell, which is in the Windan Forest region, that will trigger whether or not you want to have the Elven Aid um, delegated to the military or the economy. So it is no longer turn-based, it is simply retake Morded Hell, which has a very strong Rune Garrison in it, so you're going to need a powerful military force and then from there, you can go into which type of units you want to be able to recruit and how you want to play their campaign. It is very, very fun. I like that change. The end script has been restored, so they now attack Isengard once you have eight regions. So it's not tied to the like lumber camps. It's once you've expanded a lot. So be aware of that as you play Isengard. Uh, the Corsair invasions have been removed for Gondor and Dolomroth, so you no longer have to worry about random pirates attacking random settlements that you have no control over now as long as you pretty much patrol the waters with your ships and keep an eye out you shouldn't have any surprises from the rr to nine and typically from my experience they won't really decide to sail out into your farther settlements they'll typically want to sail near like gobel tolfalas and pilar gear and like your nearby settlements you shouldn't have to worry about somewhere like Thara Grandost or Lon Gadolin, but keep an eye out anyway. As long as you manage the waters, you shouldn't have any surprises there. If you play as Arid Luin, you now have the Buzzard Doom Reclamation. So if you go over to Buzzard Doom, you will be able to um, basically restore these vaults or unearth them, which will give you access to a very, very powerful unit. Probably the most powerful pike unit in the game, the Balerian Honor Guard. But there is a cost to that if you go into the vaults, you might just awaken something of shadow and flame that awaits in the deep, so be prepared for that. There is also new voice acting for the Wildmen factions, Anduin, Enenweith, Dunland, and also for Dol Emroth, so credits to Liam Taylor and Special Sunday for doing those. If you play as the High Elves, now Elrond and Círdan are both your faction leaders, and Elrohir and Eladan are your faction heirs, so they have dual leaders and dual heirs. Kind of to show that Círdan is the leader in the west and Elrond is the leader of Imladris. There's also new traits and ancillaries to reflect the overhauls for Dorwinian, Anduin, Annenwyth, and Dunland. The Ardenayim conscription units have been overhauled, so it is going to be four units per faction across the board of Tier 1 and Tier 2. So you'll get three Tier 1 units and one Tier 2 units through the conscription camps. Um, but they also replenish faster than they before, and the units are more specialized to the faction's focus. So, for example, if you if you go to Dale, it's a very archer-heavy faction, and you'll get a lot of archers from their conscription camps. And if you go to, like, Rohan, you'll pretty much have nothing but cavalry there. I, you might have an infantry unit. I'd have to go check, but you guys can explore that on your own. And all except for Angmar include a Tier 1 mounted unit. So you will get cavalry anywhere... Um, with the Ardenaim conscription system, except for an Angmar. So if you decide to go all the way up north, don't expect to get any cavalry up in Angmar because their cavalry are wargs, and you do not get wargs as the Ardenaim. Also, every single faction now has the way station building, so you will be able to replenish your elite and area of recruitment restriction units anywhere as long as it's a castle and it has the 
excuse me, the way station built up. So if you have Fountain Guard in Gondor and you're like crusading up in Dale, you can replenish the Fountain Guard if you take a castle like Burgram comes to mind and you build the way station there. So you no longer need to send the units or send the boys back home. You can just retrain them while they're up in far lands, which is a nice quality of life feature, helps you keep your elites replenished in the front lines, and honestly it makes elites more valuable, I would say, because you can consistently use them in battle and replenish them without having to worry about using, you know, militia in lands where you have low culture requirements. The farmhand pikemen are now exclusive to Bree and are a real pike unit now, so you can't get them through chicken farming anymore, it's like Gondor or Dolan Roth or Anandwise, so they are now a Breeland only unit. The historical battles have been fixed and re-implemented, and the generals that are used with them use portraits from the Hobbit film. So now if you play like the Battle of the Five Armies and you play as Dale, you will have Bard the Bowman's picture there. Kind of just a minor feature, but those were implemented before the films were ever released, so they were never properly done. The Ardenheim and Dunedain also have trebuchets now, so all Dunedain type factions now get the best siege engine in the game. Also, the AI are now being used. Um, they're now by Finn's improved um, campaign and battle AI, so the AI will behave a bit differently than they used to, so expect a bit more of a challenge in some regards, and in some cases it can be a little easier. I mean, there's only so much that the AI is capable of. The local archer and militias have been removed from the game, and the Northern Dunedain train militia from other factions instead, depending on where they go. But the sworn infantry and the sworn horsemen are still there, so you still get those units. There's new unit cards for almost every single unit in the game, courtesy of Cowering Coma, so thanks to him, a lot of them look absolutely brilliant. And as we've said earlier, uh, Kirith Ungol has been removed, but it is now a fort, and its region slot has been used for a new region in the eastern mortar called Dars Gurum. Telethang's also been removed. That was the settlement kind of in the northeast of the map near the Kelduin River. That has now been used for the Fangorn Forest Camp region. Another big quality of life improvement is the general battle abilities. Now show their effects on the battle map if you hover over them. So if you're playing as Denethor, Denethor has Iron Fist. You can now simply hover over it and it'll tell you exactly what it does. So you no longer need to remember what the ability does. You will be told what it is within a nice tooltip. And a mini script has been added to the Barrow Down. So if you kill Barrow Whites there, um, you will add population to Mangolin, which will allow you to upgrade it even faster and restore the Barrows. And the Northern Dunedain now can recruit Steel Bowmen from the restored Barrows. Previously, it was only for Bree, but now the Northern Dunedain can do it. So there's a reason to take Mangolin and actually fight the Barrow Whites. If you want to get some early Steel Bowmen, go for that. It could be... I haven't tested it out, but it could be very useful, especially as the Dunedain have a lot of archers. You can safely kill the Barrow Whites with a, a good number of Rangers and Dunedain bodyguards and Dunedain scouts. So it should be very feasible now. I believe it's 50 population, so at most that would be like probably 10 battles to get you 500 population plus the regular growth. So it'll be a nice way to kind of get some Steel Bowmen a little quicker. I'm sure you could probably build the encampment to that level by the time you get Mangolin upgraded, but it is another option depending on how you play the game. And that pretty much does it for all of the major changes. Now, as for the future of the channel, if you care to hear about that, since Arakir Galadarathon has made his farewell video and everyone will miss him, that leaves the faction overviews to be pretty much up in the airs. I think I'll probably take over on those, but I don't want to do them in the same style that he was doing them in, but that's tough because this game is campaign map and battle map, so it's like you can show the campaign, you can show the in-depth features, um, and then you can show the units. So I was thinking I might do more of what I did with Dorwinian a while ago, in which case I made an early game guide where I kind of go into like recommended steps, a little bit about their scripts and like units that I recommend using. Um, but I'll have to think about that. I'll have to gauge some feedback because I don't want it to think like seem like I'm just copying what he was doing. But that mantle does need to be taken up in the mod. So I 
I'm going to have to put some thought into how I want to do those. But that is a topic for another day. I think for the moment, since it is Christmas break, I will probably continue to take a break from my other campaigns at the moment. I'll, I'd still like to finish them, as I never really finish campaigns on my channel. So that will... I can't remember the last time I actually properly concluded a campaign. It must have been like Mirkwood or Durwinian. I, I usually just kind of <laughs> stop playing them at some point. So I promise to have a proper end to both Dunland and to the Reunited Kingdom. And then um, I think I will probably do an Anduin campaign um, in the future because I really want to play them on the channel. Uh, but I'll probably do another poll to ask what everyone wants to see. But in the meantime, I hope you all enjoy playing Divide and Conquer version 5. Remember, the link to the Discord is down below, and you can find the installer and the instructions there. It's the same exact process as version 4.5 and 4.6, so Galadirathin's video still pulls up for that. I'm not going to make an install video for version 5. It is, it is the exact same process as version 4.5. So anyway, with all of that said and done, my friends, please go out, enjoy the mod, and if you find any bugs, this is an open beta, so there is a bug report channel in the Discord, so please put anything you find there, but make sure to scroll around and check to see if anything's already been reported, but it will definitely help the team a lot, and until the next time, my friends, farewell.